worship at Mattituck Presbyterian Church. It's Reformation Sunday. It's also Heritage Sunday. So, of course, I'm here. I'm here in my kilts. We've got some folks who go so far back in the Americas that we've got kind of original American, garb, like, you know, dressing up. We've got some German, right? Some English, some Welsh, some Scottish. Um, it's Heritage Sunday. So if you miss it this year, you can do it next year. Joe, Croatia, I can't wait to see next time. Yeah. Oh, perfect. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, we're beginning a new message series today called Out. We're going to look at four ways that God comes into our lives and calls us out of ourselves and into God's kingdom. Called Out. Sunday, November 21st at 10.15 a.m. in the parlor, we're going to have a budget information meeting. We're compiling our budget for next year. We should have close to a first draft of that budget. So not only I and the finance team and some session members, but also those people who lead ministries in our church will be at that meeting to answer questions that you may have about the budget for next year. Next Sunday, November 7th, we're going to recognize our Stephen Minister. Stephen Ministry is an amazing ministry of outreach, pastoral care, and presence that we've been doing for a good long time. It's a wonderful way to really expand our ability to reach out to people who are in need, people who can't be here in person. We're going to recognize our Stephen Ministers next Sunday. Also next Sunday, if you haven't done it already, our Operation Christmas Child boxes, we'd love for you to bring them. They're due next Sunday. You see some out there in the narthex. Last announcement, November 14th, Teen and Adult Challenge. They come every year. Uh, from, started from a ministry that David Wilkerson in New York City started. It's transformation of teen and young adult and adult lives through the grace of God. A testimony at each service. They'll help to lead worship. I'm very excited. If you're here for the first time or you're here um, now for the third or fourth time, you'll see in your pews these little cards. You can fill them out. We'd love to be in contact with you. You can just drop it in the plate when we take the offering. Would you please stand for the call to worship printed in your bulletin? Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 96, and it is a responsive call to worship. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Wonder and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory to his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Amen. Please continue to stand for our hymn of praise, number 33, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
seated. Please join me in the prayer of confession found printed in your bulletin. We shall pray this in unison. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As you have confessed your sins this morning and asked for God's mercy, Receive that mercy this morning by the grace of God. Amen. Please take a moment and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord, it is our joy and our honor to gather in your name on the Sabbath, on this day that you set aside to rest, to worship, to recenter our lives in you, to hear your holy word, to hear the word preached, and for us to praise you, to pray to you, to give thanks to you for all that we have, all that we are. Lord, this day we ask you to come to us, come to each of us here and gather up our hearts and minds, all our worries, all our concerns, even our sins, Lord, gather them up into your arms and give to us instead new life, a sure assurance of your presence, of your grace and peace, and Lord, of your healing touch. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now return to God our tithes and our offerings. Father, bless these gifts to your use and us to your loving and faithful service. Keep us ever mindful of those in need and all those who are near and dear to us. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. Beginning a new series today. It's four part. And we're going to look at the ways that we can cooperate with God 
as he calls us out of ourselves, out of being centered in our own lives, our own concerns, and being called into his kingdom. We're going to look at four ways that he does that. Today, Reformation Sunday, we're going to look at scripture. We know that for the reformers, holy scripture, the word of God, as a central, the, one of these central places. When we read the Bible, when we read Holy Scripture, the story is not about us. It's about God who calls us out of ourselves into his kingdom. Next week, we're going to look at what it means to listen, to listen both to God and to the person that we are knowing and loving and trying to serve. Sunday after that, we're going to look at what it means to pray and to persevere in prayer um, so that we call down God's promises, God's power. And then the final Sunday, we're going to look at what it means to give, not only our time and our talents, but also our treasure. What does it mean to give, and how does that call us out of our tendency to focus on ourselves? Today, Reformation Sunday, if, if that word is not familiar, it means the Protestant churches that started in the 1500s with Martin Luther and John Calvin, John Calvin is kind of the father of our tradition, started in, in Geneva, in Switzerland, then it went to England and Scotland and the Netherlands, and then it made its way to the United States. And there are some things that Protestant churches hold in common, a set of essential beliefs that they hold in common. I'm going to go over those in just a moment, and I think they're going to lay the groundwork for what we're going to really focus on this morning, which is Scripture the word of God, why it's so important in our life together. So before we get to that, I want to look at three things that the Protestant reformers loved and that they said it's essential, it's essential for us to know and to integrate into our life together, our life as followers of Christ. Grace, the grace of God, the sovereignty of God, and the priesthood of all believers. Maybe things that we're kind of familiar with. I want to review those before we get to Scripture. So grace, the basic idea, what they find in Scripture, the Reformers, we're all made members of God's family by His grace, not because we do enough right things to earn membership in that family. Another way to put it is that there are no great-grandchildren in the Christian faith. Everybody is on the same level. We're all children and we're all adopted. We're all adopted children in his family. God does not say, well, I'll only adopt you if you're really good for the next few months or years, then I'll do it. No, God in his grace comes to us. He knows our personal history. He knows our habits. He knows every bit, every part of us and he still says, no, you're mine. You belong to me. <coughs> Justification by grace through faith alone. It's a shorthand of saying what I just explained, that all of us are adopted into God's family by grace. So next idea, God's sovereignty. It says that even in the worst circumstances, God's in control. You may not quite understand how. We see this paradoxical sovereignty, this rule, especially in the cross, right? The almighty, the omnipotent God, the king of the universe becomes one of us and then suffers and dies. He's truly sovereign, all-powerful, in control. Why doesn't he take himself down off the cross? It's Pat's question from last week. Why did this awful thing, this perfectly awful thing, happen to this good person, the best person, Jesus Christ. He must want to rule, to be sovereign through the cross. That must be required. So the reformers believe that when we understand God's sovereignty, it also takes away from us the illusion that our salvation is up to us, that it's the result of our good works or our good deeds. For the reformers, salvation belongs to the Lord. He's sovereign over it from beginning to end. Last thing, priesthood of all believers. And this is going to be, I think, really crucial when we look at Scripture. In almost every religion, the priest alone is responsible for sharing God's presence with everybody else, kind of runs through the priest to everyone else. It's kind of similar to maybe 
hiring a lawyer. And if you're going to go to trial, if you're going to go to trial, do you really want to go without a lawyer? It's a similar kind of idea. Would you really want to go before God, the judge of all the earth, without a priest? The reformers looked at this. Protestant reformers looked at this way of sin and said, look, first of all, we're not on trial. In Jesus Christ on the cross, all of our sin, past, present, and future, is taken into Christ and taken away. And we're given his righteousness in exchange. So we don't need to worry constantly about approaching the judge because we're fundamentally approaching our father, our loving parent who accepts us in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can each of us be priests, people who share God's presence wherever we are, at our job, at home, with our friends. That's our responsibility. This morning, we're going to look at scripture. So why is scripture so important to the reformers? Why is it so important for us? I'm going to begin by reading Acts chapter 4. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is resurrection from the dead. So they arrested them, put them in custody until the next day. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were born of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the chief cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which you must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Why is scripture important? Why is it essential at the center of our life and what we do? Answer, it's the one place. It's the one place we go to find out who Jesus is, what Jesus wants us to do. Let me begin with a couple of stories. So it's Germany, April 1933. A group of pastors and theologians write this, quote, God has created me a German. To be German is a gift of God. God wants me to fight for my Germany. Military service is in no sense a violation of Christian conscience, but is obedience to God. The believer possesses the right of revolution against the state that furthers the powers of darkness. He also has this right in the face of a church board that does not unreservedly acknowledge the exaltation of the nation. For a German, the church is the fellowship of believers who are obligated to fight for a Christian Germany, end quote. The same year, Ernst Bergman, professor of Old Testament, he knows, he knows the Old Testament in its original language. He knows more scripture than you or I will ever know. He writes this, the 25 points of the German religion. I'm just going to share three. The Jewish Old Testament, as well as parts of the New, are not suitable for the New Germany. Second, Christ was not Jewish, but a Nordic martyr, put to death by the Jews, a warrior whose death rescued the world from Jewish influence. Last one, Adolf Hitler is the new Messiah, sent to earth to save us from the Jews. <laughs> All of this, I trust, sounds as wrong as wrong can be, right? But here's a man 
who knows scripture backwards and forwards, probably knows it better, knows more of it than I do. If national church bodies, learned seminary professors, are saying things like this, where? Where does a faithful church go to refute it, to say this is wrong, this is not where we stand? Second story. Fast forward to the United States now, present day. If you'd stayed home this morning and watched this person on television, you would have heard the following. Quote, words are like deeds. You are prophesying your future. Scripture says that we will eat the fruit of our words. Our attitude should be, I'm getting younger. God is renewing my youth like the eagles. I'm getting stronger, healthier, better looking. I'm going to keep my hair. I'm going to stay in my right mind. I'm going to live a long, productive, faith-filled life. You are a child of the Most High God. And because Jesus has won total victory for us, we are meant to be totally free from poverty and lack. No matter what the bank account says, I know I am blessed and cannot be cursed. For whatever I touch, it will prosper and succeed. End quote. This is called the prosperity gospel. It's very popular in the United States. In fact, as I mentioned, you could stay home and watch this person on TV. It teaches that financial blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for us. And that faith, positive speech, and donations will increase your health and your wealth. Right? If, you don't, if you're not doing those things, if you don't fully believe, that's why you are the way you are, right? This theology, this preaching, views the Bible as a kind of contract between us and God. God, we do our part, you do your part. You deliver these things to us. Now, you can find passages in Scripture. You can lift them out to support that. Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Maybe. Paul, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. John, beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There it is, right? It's there in the Bible. But I bet you, like me, hear this and think, there's something, there's something wrong with that, that preaching, that way of imagining our relationship with God like a contract. But how would we go about testing our intuition that it's bad theology, spiritually dangerous? How do we do that? Scripture. Scripture is the place that we would go because there we are told about Jesus, who's at the center of that story. A theology, a ministry, can be very biblical. You can have somebody who can quote Scripture from beginning to end. It can be very biblical but if it doesn't have Jesus at the center, it doesn't honor God in Holy Scripture. Scripture is the place we go. It's where we hear again and again what we heard in brief in Acts chapter 4. There is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Want to know what salvation is? Look to the Savior in Scripture. Otherwise, we try to find salvation in what? Our Germanness, our Scottishness, <laughs> our health and wealth. Right? That's the indication that I'm saved. Fill in the blank. If Scripture is the place to go, if Scripture is the place to go, this is a unique problem for Protestants. Do we need to come here? Do we need to come to church? Could it just be each of us alone with our Bibles? Right. Is that what Martin Luther, John Calvin, the reformers taught? No. The caricature is, right, Martin Luther is sort of a man with the Bible versus the church. And Luther did start out that way. He just said, look, as I read scripture, as I read the beginning of this movement of Christ followers, I see a bunch of stuff happening now that seems plainly out of step. Let's start again. Let's start again. But over time, Luther not only knows scripture, he's a professor of Old and New Testament, he also knows the Christian tradition. Right? It's been around at that point for 1,500 years. It didn't just start yesterday. 
So he's looking at people who read scripture, who read it well, and he's evaluating how they think about and do theology. The Bible is really like a set of power tools. Right? I could go to Home Depot right now if I had no knowledge of how to use I could buy a set of power tools. I could start to use them. It would be far better if I came alongside other people who know how to use them well. Not only so that I can use them, but so that I can be a part of the project of building a family, building a house of God together. That's why God gives us scripture. Not just for ourselves, but so that we together can build a life together. Ewan Cameron, my professor of church history, is adamant. Right? Luther and Calvin did not mean to simply toss the Bible before each of us to, to use how we see fit. He writes, the reformers appear to do this, but in fact they imposed a number of filters designed to protect from inexpert handling. Right? Think again of power tools. And that meant three things. First, scripture reveals itself by the spirit it involves centered in the word. The Bible is the authoritative source of all doctrine. It can be understood correctly only with the aid of careful reading in the original language. That's why Presbyterian, Lutheran, other pastors are charged, you've got to learn Greek. <laughs> you've got to learn Hebrew before you get up in the pulpit and pretend to understand what God's word is. Second thing, preaching is meant to be the common property of people of God, not the individual property of Christians. So handling the Bible is the task of the pastor, but also the congregation to hear and to receive, to preach and to give. Third, the vast output of the reformers themselves. They, they wrote catechisms, they wrote primers for children, they wrote the institutes of the Christian. These were all things that were meant to orient us in our reading of scripture, to help us to navigate our way through that that deep, rich, life-giving forest. So for the reformers, scripture alone, that, that was their rallying cry, meant two things. Where the traditional medieval Catholic teaching had gone wrong, they could look at scripture and say, this just doesn't follow from that, let's start again. And that word scripture for Protestants always meant go to Christ to Jesus Christ, to find him there. If in all your reading, in all your seeking, in all your learning, you haven't found him, he's not at the center of your reading of the Bible, then you've missed the point. So let's return to Germany, April 1933. Barman Declaration. So if you're wearing later hosen this morning and you're like, oh my gosh, they're digging on the Germans this morning. You know, there were a group of German pastors and churches who came together, they were in the minority, but they stood up and they said, no, this is not acceptable. They wrote Barman Declaration. Um, Hitler, as he consolidated power, he outlawed all political parties, He kind of slowly brought the church in step by step kind of under his power. But these pastors and churches stood up and said no and very publicly wrote something that went out into all the newspapers. They wrote this, Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear, which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. We reject the false doctrine of the German Christians, the Nazi Christians, as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its preaching, its proclamation, something apart from and besides this one word of God. It's a kind of grand historical, we're not living in that kind of time now, but it does clarify, doesn't it? For us, it's more about living day by day. How do we center our lives in scripture, especially in Jesus Christ, who we find there? I, I bet in some form you're hearing this question a lot. Which side are you gonna take? Decide, and decide fast, right? Decide on the basis of who you are if you're not sure of who you'd like to be seen with. Decide this day whom you will serve. If you don't, how will anyone know where you stand? I believe God is accompanying us in this time where we have all these competing voices trying to come in and tell us in some way 
this is what salvation should look like for you. Right? This is salvation. It's not easy to hear God's voice in all of that if we're just trying to think our way through it. We're not centering our lives in scripture and in the Jesus Christ who we meet there. The one who comes to us and says, who do you say I am? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I ask? Do you want to go away from me as well? Remember the crowds went away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter, do you love me? To hear Christ's voice in the middle of all the voices competing for our time and attention, better competing to make us believe that our salvation lies in their message. To hear Christ's voice, there is only one place to go. Holy Scripture, the Bible, the Bible alone. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Will you please stand for our final hymn? Son and Holy Spirit, remain with you now and always. Hallelujah.